Well, good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Welcome to those who are live streaming this morning, and we're praying for your blessing as you worship in spirit and truth. Um, we mentioned the clothing drive, and I just want to encourage and thank Logan for taking that on and all the, the beautiful work that they did with that. And then the Christmas box uh, that Rachel has been overseeing, there's 400 of these uh, that they've been packed and purchased and got already, and so we want to just kind of pray and ask God's blessing on both of those things and join our hearts together for the gospel. Father, we thank you. We thank you that he who was rich became poor so that we who are poor could become rich in Christ Jesus. Oh God, is that beautiful. I thank you for those who were given coats and clothes yesterday and the words for how to have eternal life. I thank you for the perspective that you gave to the sweet ones who went down there to hand them out and just be reminded. Sometimes our problems seem to get so big and we go and we look at one who has no place to even lay their head. God, thank you for the abundance that you've given us. Let us care for the downtrodden and the needy. I pray for these Christmas boxes, Lord, as they go out and bless these children. Lord, I pray as they read the gospel that will be inside of each box, that you would give them the hope of eternal life. And so, God, thank you for these hearts. I pray, Lord, that we would never be able to, to just um, let people be perishing without our great concern. God, let us all the more keep finding ways to proclaim the gospel that we're unashamed of, the gospel that is your power to bring people into the realm of salvation. And so God, please continue to guide us and stir our hearts and lead us for ways to sow this glorious gospel in a day and age where people are struggling and wondering and foundations are being removed. God, there's one foundation that can never be shaken, a strong tower and refuge, a very present help in the time of trouble. And so God, may we lift high Jesus Christ in these days. I pray, Lord, that you would pour out abundant blessing. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Well, this Thursday is Thanksgiving, and I've been praying that your hearts are made full as we remember and give thanks to our God for his tender mercies that he's bestowed on us so lavishly in Jesus Christ. On Tuesday night, uh, our community group opened up the, uh, the, we're studying the attributes of God, and we just looked at God's goodness and spent an evening just marveling at how good God is to his people and the goodness of giving us his son. And so I, I pray that your hearts are full with all of the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. This morning, we are going to take back up in our study through Romans. Oh, Romans, how I have missed you. Let's go. Turn to Romans chapter 5. And what I'd like to do is just set our context. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then we will pray. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, our hearts are overwhelmed. The way you demonstrated your love to us, you sent forth your son and he died in our place. And so, God, our hearts are full. 
And I pray now as we seek to unpack this, that your spirit would illuminate these words to each mind and every heart would be inflamed with love to you and our wills would be set to serve you the rest of our days. And so God, I pray, meet us in a special way as we worship now together in oneness through the word of God. Amen. We've been working our way uh, through the book of Romans, and as of late, before my vacation, we were working in chapter 5. And chapter 5 is like the Fort Knox of Christianity. It's just been pure gold. And I just want to give a quick, brief review of Romans as we get back in, since it's been about six or seven weeks. Chapter 1 through 3, Paul's not ashamed of the gospel. He begins with the bad news. He begins with showing us that the wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And we learn that Jew or Gentile, whether you live in the sanctuary or the slum, whether you're moral or immoral, you're all equally under the wrath and condemnation of God. And so we come in born sinful from Adam and we continue with our natures and we sin against this God. And Paul taught us that no one can deliver themselves from this condition. Religion, uh, moralism, nothing can get you out of this condition. And then Romans 1 through 3 is to just shut you up and be silent before God and finally say, thou must save and thou alone. And we came then to Romans 3.21, but now. This is what God has done for us to save us. This is God's doing. He did it all. He's accomplished what we need for salvation. And he showed us that Jesus Christ came into the world and did all of the work. He lived the life that we should have. He died the death that we deserved on a cross so that now by faith, we can be justified before our God. We can be declared not guilty. We can be acceptable and loved and brought into his presence. Chapter four, we looked at faith. We're not working ones to get this gift. We're believing ones. And we look away from anything but Jesus Christ and receive the free grace of God. Romans 5.1 then, therefore, having been justified by faith, what is our new relationship then with God? What do justified believers enjoy? What do they get? We will spend all of eternity counting our bounty and looking at what we have in Christ. And so justification was somewhat of a courtroom where you're brought in and it's this legal declaration before God that God says not guilty, the judge of the universe. And it's shown how God could be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. Paul then brings us now to the heart of God. So we, we're now going to look at the, the relational, that's the judicial. Now here's the relational aspects of the gospel. Instead of having enmity with God, We now are at peace with God. (laughs) Instead of being under his wrath, we stand in grace. Instead of hell for all of eternity, this train is bound for glory. And the wonder of wonders is we're brought into the deep, deep love of Jesus. The whole Trinitarian love just plunged into it. And so we've outlined chapter 5 this way. In verses 1 through 2, we've looked at the blessed reality of peace with God and standing in grace. In verses 3 through 4, we looked at a blessed perspective. And he says, we rejoice that we're going to glory. But he says, the same way, we rejoice that God brings tribulations and squeezings into our lives to to bring about this moral growth and perfecting and changing us into the image of Christ. And it produces a hope that will never disappoint And so we're a people who can rejoice in tribulations because of how God is using them as a knife to cut the flesh off our hearts, to hope more in this gospel and in the living God. And then in verses 5 through 8, we looked at our blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. So here's your outline this morning. We're going to look at two manifestations to us of the love of God that gives us this blessed assurance. And the first point in verse 5 is that God's love was poured out into our hearts. Last time we were in Romans, we studied this, and we saw that this is very subjective. 
It's very uh, emotion. It's God speaking his spirit actually um, lets you know he bears witness with your spirit that you're children of God. And so one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to testify that you are loved by God. This gospel brings you into that place of God's love. And so the spirit is going to testify to your spirit of that. And then our second point in the outline is God's love poured out in the world (coughs) in history. So these are objective truths that by his son, God sent him in the world to accomplish salvation. So you got the spirit who's going to testify with your spirit that you're loved by God. And he sent his son into the world to die on a cross. So as you look at it, objective truth, doctrinal truth, reality, that you are loved by God with his son hanging on a cross on Calvary's tree. And so God wants you to know his love, child of God. It's been poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And I gave you a definition of God's love. Let me take a sip of water real quick. I'm a little excited. This overwhelms me that God's love is an exercise of his goodness toward individual sinners, whereby having identified himself with their welfare, he's giving his son to be their savior and now brings them to know and enjoy him in a covenantal relationship. He brings you into this peace. And last time when I closed out, I read the great Puritan John Owen, and I want to start with that again this morning. He said, unacquaintedness with our mercies and our privileges is our sin as well as our trouble. We hearken not to the voice of the Spirit given to us, that we may know the things that are freely bestowed on us of God. And this makes us go heavily when we might rejoice and to be weak where we might be strong in the Lord. Out of great personal experience and the observation of many Christians, how few of the saints are experientially acquainted with this privilege of holding immediate communion with the Father in love. With what anxious, doubtful thoughts do they look upon him? What fears and questioning of him? What questionings of his goodwill and kindness? And the best may think there's no sweetness at all of him toward us. But we were purchased at the high price of Jesus. And it is true that alone is the way of communication. But the free fountain and spring of all is the bosom of the Father. The Father himself loves you. The Holy Spirit will testify that to your spirit. And then our second point then that we'll look at, that was all review. This point is God's love then poured out in the world in history, objective, by his Son in verses 6 through 8. And so let's take a look at it first. A couple thoughts I want to look at is that this pouring out It's factual, objective content. And so it's not just sitting here and the Holy Spirit just comes and zaps you. It it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Jesus just got my number. It's through the knowledge of Christ Jesus crucified that we experience God's love. So it's objective content of Jesus Christ being a satisfactory propitiation for God on a cross with his wrath for us. So let's look at this. First, I want to look at a theological reason, a biblical reason, and a historical reason. The theological reason to this is in John 16, 14, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and he shall disclose it to you. So there's this theological reason of the whole new covenant is the Holy Spirit will take of Christ and will be a floodlight and reveal him to you and manifest him to you. And so the Spirit of God will disclose Jesus Christ, objective, real Son of God, to you. The Spirit's role will glorify the Son. So this will never be an end around of the Son of God and his work. You will see the glory of the love of God in Christ, objectively. And then the biblical reason, if you'll look with me in verse 5, the love of God is shed abroad. And then in verse 6, 4, 
for as an explanatory connection now of what it is. So what is that love that's being shed abroad in our hearts? And it's verses 6 through 8. It's facts. It's historical event. It's God demonstrating his love in history. So just the biblical grammatical connection is that it comes through Christ. And then the historical reason that 2,000 years ago on this earth, on a hill named Golgotha, the blood of Jesus Christ drenched the sod beneath the cross. So the Son of God hung on a cross and he spilled out all of his blood on this earth in our place for sin. And that happened in history. So I ask you this, which is it to know his love? Is it an experience in our hearts that is subjective? Or is it objective facts of beautiful doctrine about what God has done in Christ? And Romans says, yes. We have give me experience today. And we have give me just facts and doctrines and catechisms. But this word for, Paul is saying this experience is worked out by the Holy Spirit doesn't do an end around in your head and ignore the facts of the cross. But the Holy Spirit brings the truth of verses 6, 6 through 8, an objective understanding in your head, and he brings it into your heart, and he pours it out that God's love is for you. And it overwhelms you that he loves you. And this takes it from academics to being born again. And the church is filled with people who have just experienced that haven't been born again and people who just have doctrine that have never been born again. And this is what salvation is, is God's going to reveal this by his spirit through his son to you. So get this. Christianity is meeting with God. It's not a logical equation. It's the Holy Spirit shedding abroad in our hearts the love of God experimentally by the work of Jesus Christ on a cross. The content of verses 6 through 8, concrete facts and realities. And so I pray, the more you learn of this, the deeper and sweeter the love of God in Christ Jesus grows in our hearts. Amen? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So let's unpack these verses. Three times in our passage this morning, Paul writes about the death of Christ. That is the cornerstone that we will see God's love for us is at the cross. And so the truth that the church of God gathers and remembers often is the wondrous love of God in Christ Jesus on Calvary's tree. The wonderful, historical, amazing cross of Jesus Christ on which the Prince of Glory died. Charles Spurgeon said, the motto of all preachers must be, we preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon without Christ, he said, is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. I was before gluten-free and all that nonsense. (laughs) No Christ in your sermon, sir. Then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. So let's consider a couple things here in our passage. Look with me in verse 6. I want you to consider the time. At the right time. For while we're still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. A better translation would be at the appointed time. Before the world was, before time existed, God planned this glorious way of salvation. His son would come into the world. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And he would come and he would make atonement for sinners. Galatians 4.4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. What time was that? When we were helpless, when we were ungodly, when we were sinners, when we were enemies. At that time, Christ died. At that time when the world lay in darkness, a bright light shone upon them at that time. So please hear this, not at the time when you had it all together, not at the time when you were on your A game, 
when he had cleaned up enough by going to church. At the right time, God's time. This is God's time. This is God's love. This is God's plan. Our salvation is entirely an action founded upon the love of God. And at that time, he sent forth his son into this world. And secondly, I want you to consider then the character of those this death was for. The backdrop of the infinite love of God that we are looking at is the backdrop is this black velvet that will make the diamond of God's love shine even brighter. And I've shared before in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And D.A. Carson says it, it's, it's the world and all of its badness and all of its lostness. And so God so loved the world and all of its lostness and brokenness and badness. And as we're, we're just watching what's happening in our society and in our world, and the, the chaos is just growing and spreading. And I'm just looking at the badness that God loved it so much that he sent his son into the world that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. I want you to see the descriptive words that Paul's about to use and describe it. It's us. Don't miss this in verse 6. We, in verse 8, he says two times, he died for us, us, and then another we. We are to own them and we're to put them on and say, you are the man. Remember in Romans, he, he wants you to look and stare at that this is you. So these are hard statements about us that the opposite of what our culture tell us everything that we've ever known. Our life preservation is that I'm okay. I got to keep believing that. I can't tell myself that I'm this bad. This may be hard to hear if you've just walked in this morning. So this is the phrase, this is, so is the phrase cancer, malignant tumor, terminal death. Those are hard phrases, but they're necessary to get to the cure. And so I want you to hear the the diagnosis. It's designed to help you see the beauty of the cure to where it takes away your life to serve God. It's why you do it for a while. So many people, I watch them, they quit. They they have spurts because they just have this superficial diagnosis. And so I want you to hold still this morning, please. And let God, not me, let God tell you what you are before him and not what you think you are or not what you want to be. And so just hold still. You know, when they give you the shot and they say, hold still, that's hold still. For a while, we were still helpless. This word means without strength, total inability, powerless, helpless. Don't you love that diagnosis? Don't you love to be told you're helpless, feel good? I was just thinking, you know, when I'm trying to open a jar you know, and it just won't open. And you're trying, and it's like, it's got to be because my hands are greasy. How many of you, how many of you men want to say, here, honey, will you open this for me? <laughs> you know, I, I kind of felt like that while you were helpless. You know, you, you could do nothing. You couldn't do anything to get yourself right with God. There was nothing you could do to earn his love, his favor, get at peace with him, get him to like you. You were helpless. Ephesians 2.1 says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You could no more respond and help yourself than a corpse could help himself. I heard this illustration this week. I want you to picture an infant, a newborn. Let's say Taylor and Haley have a little baby girl or something like that. If you haven't heard he's having a baby, which means I'm going to be a grandpa. Great illustration. So let's say Haley makes some baby food with one of those little grinders and carrots, peas, and squash, and you put them in there and you're grinding them. And she sits down at the table and says, all right, little baby, it's time to eat. And the baby's laying on the blanket on the floor and the baby's got to climb into the high chair to eat. It will never happen. That baby, it's a new, it's never going to be able to climb into that high chair. And so she's going to have to pick the baby up and feed her if that baby's going to eat. And that's the gospel, is we would have laid there and died in our sin. 
We could have never done anything to get right with God, but at the right time, we were helpless. God came to help. Thomas Boston said, the arms of natural abilities are too short to reach supernatural help. I was helpless. I could do nothing to save myself. If you've come here this morning, you're lost in sin and there's nothing you can do to fix it. You're helpless, as all of us were. So the love of God is that we were helpless and God helped us. Second, Christ died for the ungodly. To be ungodly is to live as if God isn't important. It means no glory. There, there's no um, weight to God. He, he's just something up there, the big man upstairs. There's no weight to the glory of God. In Romans 8, 118, the wrath of God is revealed against all what? Ungodliness. It's to deny God. It's a fierce opposition to God. It's that enmity we talked about. You're opposed to his sovereignty and his rule. We didn't want God to have his way over us and tell us how to live. We didn't want to accept his uh, perfect righteous standard. We didn't want to accept his salvation that I'm helpless. And so we were ungodly. We were opposed to him. And so get this, when you're helpless, you can feel a little sympathy to helpless people. But ungodly is a fist in God's face. I'm against you. It heightens the problem. I don't want you. I don't want your rule. I don't want you. So the helpless, you you might cry for help, but the ungodly refuse to act, ask for help. I don't need him. I've sat with more unbelievers with their lives falling apart, destroying marriages, drugs, just everything is decaying. And they sit there and say, I think I'm doing pretty good. I don't need God. That's ungodly. I will not have God. I don't need him. And you're dying. Thirdly, while we were yet sinners, he didn't love us when we were cuddly and cute. He didn't love us when we were righteous and good. I want you to hear this, but while we were yet sinners, white hot sinners, while the fountain was foul, everything that proceeded forth was sin. Our hearts were dark and depraved and everything that came out of us was self and sin. We were just sinners. It wasn't while we were cleaning up or recovering sinners that Christ died for us. It's the best news you could ever hear. While you were sinners, Christ died for us. And in verse 10, we'll look at that next week. But he says, while we were enemies... We were at enmity with God. And that's the backdrop for how we see the brightness of God's love. And so let's look at what God has done in history in this world. God did not merely love in word only, but he loved in deed. And I want you to consider then God's act of expressing his love. Christ died for the ungodly. Let that word ungodly grip you. And then let the word Christ died. I don't know of anything more opposed, ungodly, and the Son of God dying on a cross. But God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Christ proclaimed the love of God. God didn't just give us a helping hand, but he gave his only begotten Son to come into this world to die for us. And he died for the ungodly. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? I can jump on a plane right now and fly to the spot they believe, most likely, where royal divine blood was spilled out for me. And all I brought to the party was my sin and my ungodliness. At the right time. At that time, Christ died for the ungodly. Look with me at verse 7. For one (coughs) will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone may dare even to die. And so who would die 
for a righteous man, but perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even die. What a, what a picture. Donald Barnhouse gave these two illustrations that, that, to help draw this out. He said, I want you to picture two men trapped in a, a mine that caved in. And from the explosion, poisonous gas, he said, was escaping. And one man had a wife and three children. True story. His gas mask was torn in the explosion. And the second man took off his mask and he forced it on the other man and said, you have Mary and the children. They need you. I'm alone. I can go. And he died for that man so he could go back to his family. Then I heard the story of a boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. And this little boy laid down and they put the needle in him. And when it was over, the doctor said, son, you saved her life. And the boy said, how long now until I die? Because he thought he was giving all of his blood and was going to die for his sister. And so these stories, and, and we've seen them again and again, of the highest that human love can go. Yet Romans 5 eclipses it all, is what Paul is saying. The highest of divine love, as we were his enemies and we hated him and we were spitting at him. While we were in that state, Christ died. I heard another illustration. I want you to picture that you lost your whole family in the Twin Towers when they crashed on that September day. And then when they found bin Laden after years of searching, the Navy SEALs are going to go in and they're going to shoot him. And as they go in, you jump in front of them and you take the bullet for him. That, that would be astounding. And yet it all falls so short of what we're looking at this morning. Verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in contrast to dying for even a good person. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so look at Christ hanging on a cross, despising the shame, the whole gruesome scene. And look at who he's doing it for. Helpless, ungodly sinners who are enemies. That is the proclamation of the love of God. And the word demonstrate, it means to prove something by evidence. Stare at the evidence. It's proof. And what is that? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The evidence of God's love for us is shown in its fullness at the cross. Paul said, husbands, how should you love your wives? I need a good illustration. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christian, could there be any greater truth in all of the world that in Christ God loves me? What more must God do to prove that he loves you? I'm going to close with John Owen once again. Be fully assured in your hearts that the Father loves you. Have fellowship with the Father in his love. Have no fears or doubts about his love for you. The greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father is not to believe that he loves you. Powerful. So please hear this. God desires so much for the child of God to know that his love is yours, that he sent forth his spirit into our hearts to testify and cry Abba and the nearness and the love of God. And he sent forth his son into a world that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that is the lens that I'm looking at everything through. When I look at coronavirus and all that it's done, I'm looking at it through this lens. When I look at our government and some of the things that we're watching going on in our day and age, I'm looking at it through this lens. And the riots and the rebellions and the destruction of economy and all the things, I just want you to lift your eyes and look through it all 
that God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the cross. I was, I was with a couple of the homebound saints who are so sick they can't come and be with God's people. And the one thing that is sustaining all of them is, is this cross. And, and it's just beautiful to hear testimonies of what God's doing. And I pray, keep praying for Mike Murphy and Cheryl Reed are the two that I'm thinking of. And so the cross is my contact lens. I just get up every morning and I put it in. And, you know, why are you optimistic? Because I look at everything through the lens of Jesus Christ. How can you be pessimistic with that contact in your eye? Amen? But God offers to the soul that rests in this love. And so I just want to speak to any unbeliever who might have walked in here this morning. You might have walked in and not even known that you're an unbeliever. And I, I want you to see what God did in putting his son up on a cross while we were helpless and ungodly and sinners and enemies. And I want you to see that it's not a call to clean yourself up. It's a call to believe the love of God, what he's done in his son, Jesus Christ. And this morning, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and be saved. So come to Christ. Believer, believer, we must live in God's love and let it deepen and grow and take up your hearts. If it means nothing to you, something's really, really wrong. And it's easy to miss. It's easy to get lost in learning. Just comfortability of a way a church functions, like just this is what you do apologetics, books. My professor at seminary, and Jay, your professor too, I think he was still there, Dr. Zemek. Was he gone when you were there? Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Zemek, someone, he was probably the smartest man I've ever known. And someone said, what's the greatest truth you've ever learned? And he said, that's simple. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. This truth alone could cure so many things hurting and plaguing your hearts this morning. I'm telling you, this is the cure for what you're facing. This text tells me so clearly I was helpless, ungodly, a sinner and an enemy. I was just not only undeserving and ill-deserving, but I was hell-deserving. I deserved to burn in hell forever because of who I was. I think too many people are like the, the guy in this movie I saw once. It's called Fireproof. I think that was the name of it. And there was this guy who kind of thought he was a bag of chips, and he wasn't. And he's looking in the mirror, mirror, combing his hair, and he's just smiling and winking and blowing kisses at himself like, you are just the bomb. And I just see too many people walking around in the church doing that. Christ laid aside his throne for my soul, for sinners. Gaze at the sun. This is God's love for you. It's his proof of it. And the Holy Spirit, may he shed it abroad in your hearts. Second, as a believer, can I lose my salvation? There's a lot to that, but I'll just say no. It depends 100% on what Christ has done. He died for the ungodly. You couldn't do enough to get it, and you can't do enough to lose it. You're not strong enough to overturn the work of Jesus Christ. I'll lose none of mine and I'll raise them up on the last day. Three, this hit me hard. Go back to verse eight. But God demonstrates his love toward us. It's in the present tense, so it's not translated very well. <clears throat> God is demonstrating his love. His death happened in history. It was completed. It was finished. But now God continues to take that event and to prove his love daily to you. He's demonstrating his love to you. I heard about a counselor where this couple came in and they, they'd been married 30 years and they were having terrible fights. And, and he said, you know, what seems to be the problem? And the woman said, I just don't think he loves me. And the guy said, honey, look, I told you when we got married, I loved you. And if it ever changed, I would let you know. So many of you live your Christian life that way.
Have you ever met a wife who thrives under that? I haven't. A wife thrives when she daily sees this love manifested and shown. And what I love is God is demonstrating his love to you. It's not, I loved you when you believed and that glory I'll tell you again. Every day he's demonstrating his love to you in Christ Jesus. Drink that up. This is the joy of the believer. The cross of Christ preaches to me daily that God loves me. And it has to fight through a lot of junk in my mind, my heart, my past, my life. I have so many things that fight this truth. And I got to keep renewing my mind in this word and looking at the cross of Christ, that he can only love me in Christ. And I need you to just keep renewing your mind because there's so many things that will fight against this. If you're sitting here as a believer battling with this, there's something. Get in the body. Talk to people. we got to figure out what it is to keep renewing your mind. Why can't I believe that God loves me as a child of God? If it's sickness or disease, if it's a wayward child, the holidays, you're missing someone really special at the table this year. Rejection, hurt, sins of your past, sins of the present, things, sins you're contemplating. I want you this morning to let this beam shine right into your hearts that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I just see so many of you bound up in duty and doctrine where you're so tight that I want you this morning to, to be, have freedom to love God and love others. This is what will unloose you. And it's that God demonstrates his love to us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. God loves me, even me, amen. <laughs> Fourthly, I'm a broken record, but I'm going to say it again. Perfect love casts out all fear. When you look at what's been shed abroad in our hearts and what God did in his son, what are you afraid of? <laughs> Anything you've come in here with this morning that you're afraid of? Anything you're sitting at home that you're afraid of? I want this perfect love. Let it drive it out. Don't live in fear and bondage. Live in fear of God. But let, it, let this perfect love drive out whatever you're afraid of. There's something you're holding that you're afraid this morning. Perfect love can drive it out. I mean, drive it out. Oh, what that would do to the children of God. And then fifthly, lastly, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's the one who reveals this to us. And, and so when you grieve him, you're cutting off your lifeline to, to know his love and be transformed and changed into his image. And so there, nothing is more suicidal than sin. And so if you're just so, you don't even know God's love, he's so distant, he's gone, you know why? Sin. And sin needs to be repented of and confessed and turned from. And I, I pray that we would walk in the Spirit and not carry out the deeds of the flesh because that will just squelch and starve the thing that I need more than anything else, to know the love of God in Christ Jesus. I've never met anyone drinking up sin is just drinking up the truth of God's love. God's love is, and I can just keep sinning, and he loves me. That's false. He loves me so much, I never want to sin against that love again. Isaac Watts, you knew I was going to close with that. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, <coughs> my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ, my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Were the whole realm of nature mine, that would be a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, 
demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's go pray. Father, I pray that every heart is overwhelmed with your love. I pray for those who are discouraged and fighting despair and trials and tribulations. We exalt even in those because they purify this hope of what we're looking at. This hope of what Christ purchased on that cross is going to be the place where there are no more tears and sorrow and we'll never know the word death ever again. God, let this, let this drive out fears and hurts and anxieties as we just gaze universally, corporately right now together at the Christ who's demonstrating his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, he died on the cross for us. Do this in remembrance of me. God, may we never drift from this beautiful cross. I thank you for the love that you have for us in Christ Jesus. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. And all God's people said,